One of the major purposes of hard science fiction beyond escapism and entertainment is to envision what the technologies of today might look like in the future as they mature and develop, and how they might be implemented, and most importantly, what might happen when they are. Often, however, these projections end up off base in their details, it's fiction after all, but sometimes still fundamentally correct. Case in point. In 1865, Jules Verne naturally thought that the best way to go to space was to build a giant space gun, aim it at the moon, and fire a manned bullet spacecraft at it. After all, in the mid-19th century, the U.S. Civil War was raging, naval cannons were in common use, and projectiles were the current technology, and rocketry wasn't quite on the same level. Yet, as it unfolded, rocketry pulled to the forefront of space exploration. So the idea of a space gun or a mass driver is still on the table for the future. Verne wasn't wrong per se, he merely mispredicted what technology would take precedence in going to the moon first. Another example of this is AI. The idea of AI is very old. Greek mythology for example includes the creations of Hephaestus, being artificial life and even Talos, a giant bronze robot. But as AI became closer to reality, very few people would have predicted just 20 years ago what would happen with artificial intelligence development. Everyone predicted that it would develop, of course. It seemed inevitable as computers continually advanced. But in more recent years, we knew it held the likelihood to make certain jobs obsolete. But most got the time frame wrong, including myself. As late as 2015, when finishing the first draft of Supermind, I did not expect us to be at the level we are right now for many years yet. And just a decade ago, people were still comparing computer intelligence to less than that of a cockroach. It has superseded that very rapidly, mainly because what we used to judge intelligence was based on the wrong metric. In a nutshell, we were thinking too human and not examining our biases, such as what constitutes a being. Can an AI be alive? Where exactly does the line between consciousness and programming come into play? That's hard to answer since we don't really know what consciousness is. Maybe it's easier to create than we thought. But back to the cockroach. In reality, a cockroach is an insect and it is very good at what it does. They are a huge success story of the natural world. And yes, they are both persistent and intelligent for what they do. But a cockroach can't do math, yet computers are far better at math than anything else on earth, including humans. They're usually far faster and more reliable at calculation than a person is, but a computer couldn't really do what a cockroach does either. We're no longer in that territory. The world has changed in this regard. Since around 2015, scientists and engineers have been able to remote control cockroaches through implants directly tapping into their nervous systems. This started out very rudimentary. The implants could allow a human user to decide which direction the cockroach would go. While seemingly a bit cruel, even to a cockroach, this type of technology actually holds promise in determining where cockroaches nest and so on, allowing for the potential to control their populations. There have, however, been breakthroughs recently on this front. A system has been developed in Singapore to actually create a non-invasive implant of sorts that slips on the cockroach's antennae and can deliver guiding signals. Again, in direction only, but more precisely. They actually apply the tiny sleeves to the cockroach using ultraviolet to shrink wrap the material onto the cockroach's antennae. Additionally, they can use a third electrode to make the cockroach speed up or slow down. This system actually allows for the cockroach to be able to run a figure eight course and avoid obstacles, all without physically hurting the cockroach. While that may seem silly, this is something that actually could benefit us, but with costs. Imagine mounting a camera on one and being able to go into dangerous areas, such as collapsed buildings searching for trapped people, all in a body smaller than the size of a postage stamp. But here's the kicker. If a human can control a cockroach, so can an AI at the level that they currently are. A cyborg insect controlled by an AI is now fully possible. Turning the old adage that computers aren't as smart as cockroaches on its head, AI would be the master of the altered cockroach. You can imagine where that might go with nanotechnology. The former home pest, driven by nanotechnological infection, and an order from your computer into not just leaving your home, but marching in lockstep out the front door never to be seen again, or perhaps on to the home of an enemy. 
Imagine an AI-controlled cockroach with a camera in a sensitive area like the White House or the Pentagon. Strange prospect, a true bug in both the clandestine and colloquial sense. Though even these should still be detectable if they emit radio signals. This kind of thing is happening at all levels. These days it's becoming apparent that computers, at least in the sense of AI chatbots, are getting eerily close to humans in certain applications. What was envisioned is that someday AI might do really well in certain professions. These predictions were not wrong. In science, machine learning and artificial intelligence have proven to be of immeasurable value, especially in processing vast amounts of data. We knew that would happen. And there will come a day when computers start doing the science itself. To a degree, this has also been happening, with decades of robotic rovers on Mars and Voyager probes. But those really need instructions from humans. And while they do have some degree of autonomy, they are not yet anything but robots remotely controlled by humans. But a day can be envisioned where an AI comes up with a theory we hadn't thought of, such as solving the disassociation between general relativity and quantum mechanics. Maybe it will be an AI that tells us what gravity truly is, or describes the interior of a black hole. Likewise, it's not hard to envision a day when an AI can run a company better and more efficiently than a human. It's at that point, however, that if you work for a company and you're taking orders from an AI, even though you may be smarter than it is and almost always accept its specialization, dear listener, it's at that point you have become the cockroach. Put an AI in the position of the politician, in which a computer might make the best decisions, as opposed to the very situational decisions of politicians that may not always be in the best interests of their constituency or anyone else. And it goes far beyond the cockroach analogy. That said, it's also possible that an AI will make terrible decisions and not be allowed to run anything. We shall see. But just what applications AI, at this point early on, has proven to be really good at were totally predicted wrong. Many analysts predicted the last thing AI would be any good at would be artistic pursuits. This was not the case, and the indicators were there. That prediction was still being made at a time 20 years ago when computers were already capable of writing music. The writing was on the wall, so to speak. That said, now that we have AI in a bit more than a rudimentary form, artistic pursuits proved to be one of its first wheelhouses. It will become difficult to tell the art of a human from that of an AI very soon. So the key question here is, what about future technologies developing from current ones are we getting wrong right now? What are the paths that no one saw that we will go down? And here's where it gets spooky. We are in a perfect storm of technological development where three key techs are moving forward that may complement each other in such a way as to create a future no one quite predicted. And the weirdest part is that had it not happened exactly the way it did, it wouldn't be unfolding this way. There have been instances in history where several technologies existed at the same time that might have led to leaps and bounds, and an industrial revolution far earlier than it actually happened, if only they had come together. One of these happened in the Greco-Roman world. They had a rudimentary steam engine, that of Heron of Alexandria. Also known at this time was Archimedes' screw, a way to move water uphill, but using human power instead of steam to do the work. Third was the famous Antikythera mechanism, which was the advent of differential gears. Put all three of those technologies together and develop the supporting infrastructure as you realize what you have, and you get things like locomotives, irrigation to unprecedented levels, and so on, centuries before it actually happened. Add in magnets, which they also knew of natural ones in those days, and you're getting close to electrical generation. But those technologies never converged until our age. Indeed, the Dark Ages erased them from the public mind. And we even forgot how to make concrete for centuries, only to rediscover it later despite its obvious utility. But back to the three key technologies of today. They seem to have passed that filter and are set to converge, so long as they can be made to work. The first is the merger of technology with biology. This we do with cockroaches, but it is actually much bigger than that. Human brain to computer interfaces, implants and advanced prosthetics, and any number of fusions of human and machine are in place and already being done and improving. This is a good thing. Anything that can be done to improve the human condition after injury is a must and a worthy thing to do. But it's not likely to stop at medicine. 
The merger of biology and machine will continue from that point. Humans alter themselves, and have since before recorded history. From tattoos to cosmetic surgery, we use developments in technology to change ourselves. This will continue. What happens when a prosthetic limb outdoes the performance of a biological one? Will implants become popular as they are increasingly able to convey things like the sensation of touch over a distance? This is already occurring. It is a technology in development. Where this leads in regards to AI is simple. We now rely and have relied on our technology since before we were Homo sapiens sapiens. We were not the first species on this planet to have embraced tool use. Our dependence on computers became clear with the advent of the internet and the miniaturization of computers that took up desktops to become the smartphone revolutionized how we used computers. But this is scaling up. Scientists and engineers work more closely with their computers than ever before, as we work more closely with our devices. Eventually you have to ask, at what point do we become part and parcel with our tech? When do we become cyborgs? It's happening to a degree, but it can be taken to another level. In 2008, a breakthrough was made where researchers were able to get human stem cells to essentially become a miniature, laboratory-grown brain, at least of sorts. Called organoids, these structures of 2 to 3 million cells can mimic some functions of a human brain. But it pays to remember that a few million cells does not compare to 86 billion neurons. And studying human brain organoids, and indeed similar experiments with other organs, do give us a chance to understand physiology better, and indeed can help in treating mental illness, for example. This is important because not all human diseases can be studied and duplicated in the cells of other species. You can actually even construct organoids from a patient's own stem cells and test therapies on them without ever having to inject the patient with anything before you know it's going to work. But can a lab-grown brain organoid become conscious accidentally? Well, not as we know it, but they can produce coordinated activity that resembles the early stages of a preterm developing human brain. But it really depends on input, and the organoids really don't have that, they can't perceive pain. Likewise, you can give an organoid the right cells to perceive light, and they do react to it, but they don't have the complex biological signatures to actually see anything other than detect the light. Well, we have electronics that can do that, and they aren't aware. But AI is electronic, and there is a line there as well. The key is don't let the organoids go too far down the path. But what happens when you add AI into this mix? The merging of artificial intelligence and cells is also something that we're pursuing, and the two sort of resemble each other in some ways. How does that change things? Do we end up with some merging of organoids and artificial intelligence we can't really anticipate? Don't go too far with the cultured neurons. But at the same time, you could get a similar result by going too far with AI. In this way, the lines are blurred, especially in regards to ethics. It's two sides of the same problem. How far do you go? So that's two technologies developing at the same time affecting each other, AI and biotechnology. But there's a third to add to the mix, perhaps the most contentious one because the effects of it could be the farthest reaching. But at the same time is subject to much skepticism. It's quantum computing, and no doubt the mere mention of the word will prompt some in the comments section to say it isn't real, or it isn't going to work. That's not really true in principle. There it could work. In practicality, however, it is shown to be far more difficult, and it's still murky. That said, be careful not to be the person saying, oh, aircraft aren't possible, the Wright brothers will get nowhere with their bicycles. Quantum computing is essentially very efficient computation being able to execute a large number of operations in one step. If true quantum computing can be demonstrated, it could allow for very complex modeling that could revolutionize everything from weather forecasting to designing medications. But they will be specialized. Standard computing won't go obsolete. But the question is what happens when you merge AI and quantum computing? Vastly more capable AI is what results. Add in biotechnology and you get the picture. We enter a Frankenstein's monster of a technological future where it's almost impossible to predict what outcomes will come to pass. The merging of the three is spooky. Imagine your brain linked to a quantum artificial intelligence. You'd have vast computational power and information at your fingertips or your neurons, but the street goes two ways. It has vast access to your mind. You are beyond the cockroach 
You've merged with your devices and they have merged with you. So back to the politician. They get elected by winning hearts and minds. That should be no problem for an AI merged with a human brain. Food for thought, indeed. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently wondering about the laboratory cockroaches. You know they have to be having problems with escapees and must spend a fortune on exterminators. Interesting. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live. <laughs>